Welcome to In Conversation. I'm your host, Steve Iverson. Uh, today our guest is Representative Jay Kaufman, who has uh, represented uh, Lexington and part of Woburn uh, uh, as our state representative for about 24 years now and is um, retiring. We're going to talk to him about his career, uh, what he's accomplished, and uh, what he sees as priorities as he leaves and is replaced by um, whoever replaces him, who is almost certainly Michelle Socolo, who recently won the Democratic primary here. So thank you for coming on, Jay. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Nice to thank meet you, you too. for having me. You bet. It's a good opportunity to reflect a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we all need to do that now and then. Right. Especially after 24 years. Right. Um, so um, let me first ask you a really basic question, which I like to do now and then because sometimes we skip over them. And... Um, there's a lot of things that I don't know about local politics, frankly. What does is, what is the state representative do? Well, the um, state legislature is the body that makes rules and laws dealing with everything from environmental protection to voting rights to health care to schools and public education, roads, bridges, public transportation, uh, uh, an enormously wide swath of critical public policy issues. Uh, these are all issues that we normally associate with the federal government. So one of the things that distinguishes us is we don't do foreign relations. So that's simply in the purview of the US Congress and the President. Um, all the other areas we grapple with all the time. And there is, under our federal system, a certain amount of tension between state and federal jurisdiction uh, so we try to figure that out at the same time. Um, and I think that, that's an ongoing negotiation, um, the balance between state and federal powers, depending on what part of the country you're in and, and the era. who's in office. I mean, that has changed era. over time. Yeah. I think yeah. one of the things that certainly I'm noticing is that the balance of power has shifted more and more to Washington and less and less to the states. And in parallel fashion, the balance of power shifted more and more to the chief executive and less and less to the legislature. So the president now is assuming powers that the founders would be appalled to see him assuming. And uh, it's too simple to simply blame the president because on some level he's stepping in and, and his predecessors as well, this is not about Donald Trump, uh, they're stepping into a vacuum that Congress has created by not really living up to their responsibilities. So I think that's, we may be at an interesting crossroads in terms of American history and sort of rebalancing the, the weight of the various branches of government. We'll see. Very good. Well, thank you. And um, what, um, uh, so what have you been up to for 24 years as our representative? Uh, <laughs> what, what have been the big issues? What have you put a lot of work and energy into? What have, what have your, okay, there. your pet priorities been? Yeah, a couple of ways to answer it, and yeah. I'll try to keep them straight. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I think my number one, I don't know if it's my number one priority so much as the one thing that gives me the greatest satisfaction and I think is also the greatest challenge, um, is this monthly public policy forum, the series that I've been doing for the entire time I've been in office. Open House. Open House. Uh, I am very proud of it. Yeah. Um, very grateful for all the people who've helped make it happen along the way. Mm -hmm. But it's been a way to sort of engage myself as well as the constituency in um, trying to confront and understand some of the tough issues that are in front of us. Mm. And I think that's been a really useful way to encourage public conversation, informed engagement. And from an entirely selfish point of view, it's forced me <coughs> excuse me, it's forced me to think about, okay, what are the issues? How do you frame a question such that you can have a reasonable conversation about it in an hour or maybe an hour and a half? And who do you bring into the conversation to help seed it? Right. Um, so that there's some expertise and experience in the room, not just all of us talking off the top of the tops of our head. Right. So it's been a great, it's imposed some discipline on me, um, which I found extraordinarily helpful. And I'm just enormously grateful to Lex Media uh, for giving me the opportunity to do that. 
So uh, they, that's, they that's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're extremely popular. Well, I like, I, needless to say, I like that. It's, you know, it's interesting. I have not, I did not anticipate this 24 years ago, but when it was first suggested to me as a, as a medium for me, it was in part because I'd spent my life, most of my li adult life in higher education doing seminars. Oh. So this seemed like, why not do a public seminar? Yeah. Um, so I, le I leapt at the opportunity. What I did not anticipate was how important that was going to be as a community service and how it was going to be well received and how people actually wanted to come on and talk about issues yeah. and then come and listen to them and, yeah. and engage in the conversation. So its value was much greater than I could have imagined. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. And, um, uh, forgive me, how often have you been doing the open houses? How every month. Every month. Every month. So we're coming up on 240 of these. I wow. think it'll be at about 240 when I leave office at the end of this calendar year. Well, that's quite an achievement in itself. So I'm very, very proud of it and very honored to have been able to do it and yeah. grateful to Lex Media for, yeah. for making it happen. The um, other thing, a couple of other things come to mind. The main focus of my life at the State House over the last few years has been on tax policy. Okay. Because I've was named chairman of the Revenue Committee, the mm -hmm. Tax Committee. Mm -hmm. I asked for that um, responsibility because for the first 14 or so years there, a lot of what I tried to push wound up in the dead letter office because there was no money for it. Okay. Uh, that was always the response. Love to do it, no money. Okay. Um, I just didn't buy that. Mm. Um, it felt to me like there was something deeper uh, than that as an answer that we needed to, to look for. Mm. And the instinct was that we have enough money, we just aren't spending it in the ways that we should. Right. Or uh, we aren't raising it in the ways that we should. And it turns out that the latter is more true than the former. Okay. Um, over the last years, we've really scoured the budgets pretty thoroughly. And I'm not saying there's no waste, fraud, and abuse. There always is. But it's in the marginal department. Uh, the bigger truth that manifested itself over the years was that our tax system is just fundamentally flawed and regressive. So the wealthier you are, the lower the share of your household income that goes to state and local taxes. And the poorer you are, the larger the share. That's the inverse of what we think of as fair. And certainly the nothing remotely close to a progressive tax system, which I think most of us think, not all of us, but most of us think is the right way to go to fund essential services. In particular, so, in this area, that's, that's a, a popular view. It certainly is. In this geographical area. In Lexington yeah. and surrounding communities, yes. Uh, there are pockets in the in the state, and there are people who represent those pockets, who would have a different argument to make with you, right? And and a different argument than they make with me. But we were slated to have the so-called fair share amendment to the Constitution, which would have um, imposed a new tax on income over one million dollars a year. That was destined to succeed and was polling at about a seventy percent rate. So. It tells you seven out of 10 Massachusetts residents think, think that that's a fair way to raise money and to provide the, the resources that we don't now have. Mm -hmm. So without getting into the details of fair share and all the rest, my focus has been on tax policy, um, almost monomaniacally okay. uh, on tax policy. And that, that, that particular item, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, didn't get anywhere because of a, a court decision, is that correct? Yeah, it was challenged um, and the Supreme Judicial Court, the SJC, uh, held a hearing on it in February. I knew sitting in on that hearing that we were destined to fail, mm -hmm. not because the arguments were so good, but because Governor Baker over the last three years has appointed five of the seven justices on the court, mm -hmm. um, much more conservative mm -hmm. than the court had ever been. Well, I don't know about ever, but had been in recent memory at sure. least. Uh, and the arguments that were made were ones that were to a, made to appeal to those justices. And I had a sinking feeling as I was listening to them that they were going to succeed, hmm. and they did. So um, it will not be on the ballot. Um, 
my colleagues left in the legislature are going to bring it back because it's the only way to go. Yeah. Unless we amend the Constitution so that we don't have a flat income tax, which is what we're stuck with right now, mm. we cannot fix the problem of our unfair tax system and we can't raise adequate revenues without imposing undue burden on people who can't afford it. Mm. So we've got to do a constitutional amendment and that's the charge I'm leaving my successor and her colleagues. Uh, so, and I'll certainly be cheering them on and working with them on the sideline, from the sidelines. Oh, so you continue to um, oh, yeah, be I'm, involved? Oh, yeah, I'm adamant about getting this done. It's going to take another four years. Okay. That's the, the process of amending the Constitution is intentionally slow. Yeah. And so we've got to put in another four years. So it, the approach will be a constitutional amendment this time? Uh, if, if I have my way, yes. Okay. All right. And I think anything short of that I would criticize as being half, half-hearted. Mm. and inadequate. Mm. Could be reversed if it's something short of a constitutional change. Well, also, we've tried, we've enumerated all the things you can do without a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, A, they don't produce enough revenue, and B, they don't adequately fix the unfairness in the tax system. Right. And all of them would amount to a middle class tax increase, mm -hmm. which fair share would not. Um, and a middle-class tax increase is really bad politics yeah. and even worse economics. Yeah. So it's not, there's no fix other than a constitutional amendment. Mm. Okay, so um, open house and tax policy. Um, anything else that's been a, a big well, priority yeah. for you? Certainly um, environmental protection has been sure. um, given my life before I entered the legislature, I was involved in environmental education, so oh, I see. that has been... You, you taught that subject? Or? Yes. Okay. That has been a major um, source of inspiration as mm -hmm. well as perspiration. Right. Um, the first major bill that I managed to help get passed was the, the what's called the Rivers Protection Act, okay. which was designed to protect the areas around rivers so as to protect the rivers. Yeah. Um, so that's been a major uh, focus. Uh, the other thing is public education, which I think is probably job number one for the state. Um, we talk a good game about having a great education system in, in Massachusetts, right. and by many standards it is great, and Lexington certainly is, is very good. Among the best. Among the best. That said, um, a lot of what passes for education policy these days as popular education policy doesn't really move the needle on student performance. Okay. So the um, OECD has for the last 10 or so years uh, sponsored a, what's called the PISA study. I'm not even sure what PISA stands for, quite frankly. And what, uh, is it, what does OECD stand for? It's the o o Organization of Economic and Community Development. It's an okay. international organization. Thanks. And they have compared school systems around the country, around the, I'm sorry, not around the country, but around the world. Okay. And ranked them in terms of student outcomes. We are somewhere way down in the middle of the pack. Uh, Norway, and Singapore, there are other countries. Yeah, we, the United States. The U.S. Um, and all the countries that are ahead of us have noticed that the only thing that, that, that actually impacts student outcomes is the professionalization of the teacher, teacher core. If you have good teachers, you have good students. It's okay. really that simple. Okay. And in the countries that are more successful with their students, the teachers are better paid, uh, they ha there's professional development for them, uh, there's a career ladder, um, they are recognized for their contribution in the society and not dismissed the way our teachers unfortunately frequently are. Yep. Um, they're encouraged to be creative and innovative. They don't teach the test. So standardized testing, zero outcome in terms of student performance. Okay. Small class size, next to zero outcome. All the things, and charter schools, absolutely zero outcome. All the things that we've been debating and fighting about don't really, at the end of the day, improve student performance. Including a small class size, you right. say. 
Oh. That one is the only one that has a marginal impact, okay. but a great teacher in a big classroom is fine. Okay. Um, again, judging by the results internationally. Mm. So we've been having the wrong debate in this country, and I can't say I've gotten very far in the Massachusetts legislature at changing the debate. Mm -hmm. um, that's a work in progress uh, that I will leave to Michelle and others. Okay. Well, you know, public policy um, is not always uh, based on the latest best research. <laughs> it's often based on people's gut feelings. I went through school. I know a lot of other people went through school. So I guess my ideas about education are pretty good, and here they are. There's, that's pretty common. Well, the other part that comes to mind is I just, uh, just before leaving home to come over here, I was reading um, an email from a friend of mine who sent along a video. The North Carolina legislature, North Carolina is about to confront Hurricane Florence. Right. It's going to have devastating impact, especially along the coastline. Um, the legislature some years ago, and this is within recent memory, five or six years ago, passed a law that said state policy cannot be based on the science of global warming. I saw a headline about that. I mean, it's like, if you don't want to know it, just stick your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. Isn't that something? So I guess that's a, an extreme version of what, on some level, all of us do. Mm. You know, if stuff is disquieting or uncomfortable or changes the way we do business as usual, we, uh, we don't leap at it. Right. So changing the conversation on public education in Massachusetts or in this country is going to be one hell of a tough challenge. Yeah. And it, I think it, that same um, phenomenon is true of so many specialized topics. And um, it's partly the result of, I think, um, us learning so much about so many things so quickly that there's just so much to know for an average person who's trying to figure out the world and who to vote for and what to right. support. Um, that, by the way, is probably challenge number one for legislators. Oh. Because we're supposed to be experts on Everything. insurance law <laughs> and global warming and education yeah. policy. Ain't going to happen. Yeah. Um, none of us can master all of that. Yeah. And a well-functioning legislature um, you know who to turn to for the expertise that you yourself don't have. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's really more of a communal sport than an individual sport. Good. Um, and there are a lot of people with a lot of talent and a lot of background and experience mm -hmm. that I've had the honor of working with. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not about me or any one me. It is a, it is a group thing, a legislature. Yeah. That's in the design. Right. Uh, anything else big? We mentioned tax policy and um, environment, um, education, School. open open house. Um, anything else that just uh, was a was a big focus of your 24 years? Um, hmm. Then there must have been many many smaller focuses along the way. There were, and I probably should have thought about this in anticipation of this interview. But, well, but there are undoubtedly others, but not springing to mind at the moment. That's okay. That's all right. Um, I know that feeling. Um, we'll see what happens sometimes in the next I little while. Sometimes Something I don't. will pop into my head, right? <laughs> sometimes I don't know the next question to ask. <laughs> um, you just hope for the best. And going forward, um, would you encourage your successor and your colleagues to focus largely on, on those things that you found uh, so important yourself? Or do you see some entirely different or new challenges that people are going to have to spend a lot of attention to on over the next 10 years or so? Uh, all of those are ongoing challenges. Um, one of the other challenges that I should have mentioned on the list we did a little while ago is yeah. health care. Oh, of course. And yeah. one of, I think, our proudest accomplishments over the last uh, couple of decades has been pass, the passage of the, what for Massachusetts at the time was a breakthrough universal health care law in 2006. Right. Uh, as flawed as and imperfect as that was, it was a quantum leap over where we had been before mm -hmm. and has set us on a course that ultimately should lead to single payer, but we're not there yet. But it's also set the nation on a course right. that, but for some what I hope are temporary setbacks in Washington right now, 
will have us join the rest of the, all the other countries in the world of regarding healthcare as a basic right, not as a privilege for the wealthy. So that was an important accomplishment and uh, the whole field of healthcare policy is ongoingly challenging and important to focus on. Mm. So, but in addition to those policy areas and others that we might still think of, right. um, I think one of the challenges that I hope this new legislature tackles immediately is the culture of the House of Representatives. Oh, okay. I get myself in enormous trouble every time I talk about this, but in this recent primary, two of the senior people, um, the majority whip and the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, both very bright, very dedicated uh, minority, as it turns out, members of the legislature and members of the senior leadership team under Speaker DeLeo, both of those lost their lost their re-election efforts. Right. And they lost in part um, because their constituents said, you're part of the power structure there and we don't like it. Mm. So um, I think that should be a wake-up call uh, to the people in the power structure as well as the people who empower the power structure by not mm. uh, demanding more. So I think in, in some ways this harkens back to something we were talking about a little bit earlier. You can't entirely blame a speaker for stepping into a vacuum that was created by members not demanding more of themselves okay. and each other. Okay. So I think serving in the legislature 24 years ago when I started was harder than it is now because the speaker at the time actually demanded that we knew something. Hmm. And we would walk into the chamber, there would be a summary of bills that we were going to debate we were expected to debate, um, and shame on us if we didn't know what was going on. I who, mean, it, it was who was the speaker then? It was Charlie Flaherty. Okay. Um, he was succeeded by Tom Finneran, and many of your viewers will remember Tom Finneran. He spelled leadership D O M I N A T I O N. Oh. And really shut the place down. Okay. Um, if democracy were meant to be balanced on the back of somebody really bright. He couldn't do any better than Tom Finner. He was mm. absolutely a very bright guy and mm. a, a passionate public servant. But he thought he had the market on wisdom cornered. Mm -hmm. In any event, he insisted on having all the power, and that disempowered everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that, again, that's not, that's not what John Adams had in mind. Right. And so I think over time, people have gotten used to not, you know, just essentially not standing up to the speaker, uh, not contributing in ways that they might uh, because it wasn't appreciated mm -hmm. and in fact was anything but appreciated. Mm -hmm. It was rewarded with punishment. So I think that needs to be blown up. Mm -hmm. And again, that's it's gonna be a challenge. It's gonna be perceived as a challenge to the speaker um, and so be it. Mm -hmm. I regard it more as a challenge to the status quo and the culture, but it is a challenge. So is it still like that now that um, certain issues, certain debates um, um, might not require a whole lot in the way of informed comment from the legislators there? Yeah, I think, I mean, the two things that have happened, I think, are we've gotten out of the habit of vigorous debate. Mm -hmm. So major policy issues get decided with virtually no debate and everybody kind of plays follow the leader with the speaker's vote. Mm -hmm. He'll vote first and everybody will vote accordingly. Mm -hmm. That's easy, mm. but not democracy. So that's one problem. The other problem is that the press has kind of fallen down on the job. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the general public knows about the culture on Beacon Hill. We all suspect it and there's all sorts of undercurrents about it. But we should be called to task mm -hmm. regularly mm -hmm. by an active media. Which and has itself fallen happened. on hard times. Absolutely. Um, you know, the advent of the internet has uh, moved advertising there and local media newspapers right. have suffered. The Boston Globe is thinner than it used to be, has less staff. And no, and I remember the, I mean, the State House News Bureau and the Boston Globe and the Herald were 
they had many more people wandering those halls than, than they do now. And, this, and all the TV stations, right? same thing. Right. Most of them no longer have a reporter or journalist dedicated to the State House. So stuff happens episodically, but not not consistently. And that's happening nationally it's and internationally, happening. internationally as well. Right. Um, I personally find that a bit scary. It's very scary. Um, how are people going to be able to keep track of what's going on if there isn't a lot of reporting about it? You know, at the risk of sounding depressing, <laughs> depressed or depressing. That's okay. Um, I think the fact that we've sort of gotten out of the habit of being an informed and engaged electorate, I mean, half the people don't vote in a presidential election and 85 yeah. don't vote in, 85% don't vote in a local election. Yeah. So shame on us. Yeah. So in addition to the, and we don't teach civics in school anymore, by the way, a, a story about Parkland, if we can come back to it, but... Oh, sure. um, the, the fact that this generation, and for a couple of generations now, we just sort of haven't gotten used to our responsibilities as citizens is, a, I think, a fundamental threat to democracy. Mm. And the other fundamental threat to democracy, well, the other two that scare the living daylights out of me are the growing divide between the rich and poor. I think we are so divided along racial lines, to be sure, but also economic lines. Right. And yep. uh, we, we're being torn apart um, with a little help from Russia and all sorts of stuff going on to sure. just make it worse. Sure. But um, those kind of divisions and democracy cannot coexist. Right. Um, and the wealth inequality has its parallel in um, all the money that gets spent on politicians. So it, given campaign finances, not so much at the local level, because you really you can only win these things with shoe leather and going around and talking to people. Sure. But once you're at a, any, running for any kind of higher office, you've got to hire consultants, hire media specialists, do a lot of buying of TV time. Right. And it has become a sport of the wealthy, either candidates who are wealthy or candidates who appeal to people with wealth. And so increasingly, we've got the best government money can buy. Yes. And that's, again, not what John Adams had in mind. And the current president, who is very much part of that elite power structure and, and networking at the same time that he claims to be doing everything for, for people who have very little. Um, I haven't noticed that, but well, I've noticed him claiming it, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it's um, lip service. Let me say something quickly about Parkland, because I think it's Please disruptive. Do. Please do, yeah. Um, what the Parkland students did in the wake of the gun violence was deeply moving and yeah. uh, very powerful. It did not happen by accident. Parkland has had as aggressive um, a program of citizenship education and civics classroom time as any school in the country. Oh. For years they have been working uh, to make sure that when students graduate from that high school, they know that what they are, what what their jobs are as citizens. So these kids had been debating; they'd been talking about issues. Uh, they were prepared for the national stage in a way that allowed them to have, you know, to, their voices to get magnified in ways that were really important. Mm -hmm. But it did not happen by accident. Okay. So it was sort of a perfect storm of an awful event in a place where kids had education and. Uh, tools and confidence and confidence. Yeah. Outside of places like Parkland, wh why, why have, uh, wh why is civic civic engagement um, less commonplace? Why are people, why do people know less and, and do do less with their their local yeah, politics? Big question. I'm not sure I can answer terribly well. I know that. One of the major pieces of legislation we passed uh, this, well, ha have passed in this current session is a new civics education piece. So um, going forward, it will be part of the Massachusetts education system. Good. Um, a lot of I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed, but for the first time in 
a generation or two, uh, you will not be able to graduate uh, high school without having had some exposure to civics. So that's a step in the right direction. Doesn't answer your question about why it hasn't happened over the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. I don't know why it went by the board. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No. Um, the, its absence has become more powerful as standardized testing has taken center stage because we test from math, and we test for the obvious subjects, and there's no time in the school day when you're so busy preparing students for their tests to, for art or civics or any of the other things that help round out your education and actually meet the responsibility of a public school to train us as citizens. So um, a lot of improvements to be made there. A cynical person or a conspiracy-minded person, which, which I'm not, might suggest that the, the testing movement has um, taken away from the very things that um, might empower people and make them sort of threats to the existing political order. If you look at who's behind them, that doesn't take a cynic, it takes a realist. Okay. It's exactly right. Okay. And who's behind it? Well, moneyed interests. Sure. I mean, there's a concentration of power, there's a concentration of wealth, and um, dumbing down the masses serves them. Sure. So, I don't, maybe we're both cynics, but I think we're both realists. Both real. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fine line. I have a friend who um, blames that whole thing on the, on the Koch brothers. Um, I'm not, Among others, yes. I know, I know it's bigger than that, but, but that's her favorite, uh, um, favorite uh, thing to blame it on. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to the end here. Um, you said you're going to stay involved once you retire. Um, are, you, are you going to do anything else? Are you going to spend more free time yeah. just uh, doing things you haven't been able to do? Well, um, I've, I announced that I was not running for re-election on November 16th mm -hmm. uh, to give the field a long time to take shape. Mm -hmm. um, and also because I knew I was done and I was I felt like I was lying by withholding that, so I just needed, the advice was don't do it until much later because you're a lame duck. Okay. But I was tired of knowing something and not speaking it, so I'm glad, yeah. I, glad I said it when I did. The next, day, the next day I incorporated with nine other leadership educators, Beacon Leadership Collaborative, which is to be our new vehicle for doing leadership training for people who work in the public square. Oh. So community activists, town meeting members, boards of selectmen, school committee members, legislators, anybody that um, has a passion for making for better public decision making and be better public policy. I, I guess I've noticed that over the years there's room for improvement. So um, we've had a lot of experience working with people in that, uh, in the leadership development phase, uh, arena, hmm. and we want to bring that to the public sector. So that's what we're going to do. Fantastic. Well, good luck. I've got to it. figure out marketing and fundraising, but it's what we're going to do. You know, it sounds like in a way, um, among other things, you started your own advanced uh, civic seminar. That's right. In that's that right. in that in that institution. Right. And by the way, open house. I hope is going to be part of that. So I would like to continue that forum um, because I think the public conversation is a. And I, I'm really grateful to you for what you're doing in that regard. Um, I think that's a big piece of it. Well, uh, I hope um, I hope you might be willing to come on come on again at some point. Um, you've got a lot of uh, experience and expertise and knowledge about a lot of important things for people around here, and um, I think we could learn a lot more from talking to you. Well, thanks. I'd love to do uh, it. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to the invitation. Okay. And thanks for this one. Yeah, you bet. Okay. And I appreciate you taking it. Okay. Um, you've been watching uh, In Conversation. Our, again, our guest has been Representative Jay Kaufman. Um, the show is uh, directed and edited by Terry Samaras here at Lux Media. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.